that's all right. And tonight, I'm going to start right away by sharing our screen. And as you know, the topic tonight is discipleship. Whoops, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to present. Okay, there we go. Now, is everyone seeing my screen okay? Yep. Yes. Okay. Can I ask you to mute yourselves so that we won't get any background noise? That would be very helpful. Thank you. All right, so tonight's topic is discipleship. Whoops, Karen's here. Hold on a second. Okay, give me a second to let her in. Hey, Karen. Karen is joining us. There you are. Hi, Karen. We just started our presentation. So once you have audio, just go ahead and mute yourself. Everybody, this is Karen. Wave to us, Karen. Wave to us. Can you hear me, Karen? There you go. She's smiling. I think she can hear us. All right, so tonight's topic is discipleship, and here is our opening prayer, and if you would just join me as I say the opening prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, when I am a less than enthusiastic amen. follower, please refresh me in my zeal. When I am hurting or need forgiveness, in your love, please help me heal you. When I am blessed with accomplishment or well-being, may gratitude be what I feel. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And it, it does sound like Kevin is back. So Kevin and Karen, I just would invite you to mute yourself so as we go through the slide presentations, we can kind of minimize the background noise. So okay. Okay, we're going to start right away with a breakout room. So uh, the, the question we're going to ask for the breakout room is, who is your role model? So we all have people we admire. Some of them are religious people. Some of them are secular people. Some of them are family members. It doesn't really matter. This is just kind of to get the conversation going. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and I'm going to assign you all to breakout rooms, just two at a time. Okay, so let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So we'll put you in four rooms and there's the rooms and it's all very random. So here you go into your breakout rooms. You just have a couple of minutes. Who is your role model? Go ahead and join your room. I forget. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Um, and you can all unmute yourselves for a minute and tell me who were your role models? Who came up for you? My father. Okay, and, and just a short description of why? Well, he raised nine kids and um, we came out pretty good, but he taught us um, how to be good people. Very so. good. Okay, your dad. My dad is also my role model. And, and he used to say something similar. You know, a lot of parents wish that their kids would be happy, but my dad always asked for good kids, which kind of set that expectation that our own personal happiness may not be the most, you know, the greatest value in life. A good <laughs> is a greater value. Anybody else want to say who was their role model? My father. Ah. Also. Okay. Uh, he was a very uh, strong Christian man. He didn't know a lot about all the things that we talk about, uh, but he was a very um, uh, forcefully Christian man. Okay, very nice. Anybody else have a role model? It can be a TV yeah. star. Yeah, Abraham. Actually, I missed the topics, you know, so 
Oh. Now I understand about what okay. my role model is my friend, you know. Very good. Your friend. And what quality does your friend have that makes you admire them? He is a, he is a rel religious. He is a Catholic, so. Okay. Very good. I, I get some inspire from him, you know, so. Inspiration, yes. yes. Anybody else care to say? I'm just going to tell you, I'm, can you hear me? Now we can. Thank you. Yeah, I, I finally figured it out. I'm slow. So. Okay, I'm sorry. So do you have a role uh, model, Karen? Pardon me? Do you have a role model? That's our question. Who is your role model? If you have one. Yeah, it was my aunt. Okay. And my aunt Gladys, she was Lutheran, but she prayed for me my whole life. And she's really the only Christian I knew. And, uh, I think most of my life I tried to be like her, so. Okay. I thank still you. do. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else have somebody? You don't have I'll to. share. Okay, Ashley, go ahead. We said you, Claudia. What? Said, oh, a you, Claudia. Me? I said, it. yeah. A woman very full of faith and gentle wisdom. Thank you. Wow, that's nice. <laughs> thank you. Okay, we better move on from that question then. That was just too <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, and I had chosen, I had chosen Claudia also. Oh my gosh! And wow. I had various role models as I was growing up, and and great women who I admired and led me. But I'm thinking right now, with what I am called to do in my life, I see Claudia as the role model because of just, just the way she explains things and can be with people and maintains humility and yet firmness and, uh, <laughs> and yeah, well, we'll, tell, we, we'll tell you some more good things about you, Claudia. That's, that's enough for now. I'm looking at Judy because a lot of times I talk to Judy and I'm like, those people, I'm not you guys, but those people are just so blah, blah, blah. So she knows I'm not all that great, but, but thank you for the nice things you said. Let's get back to our slideshow. So we're gonna go back here. All right, and remember you can go ahead and mute yourself so that we can um, not be distracted. And I'm gonna make this little thing smaller too. Whoops, sorry. Okay, so we talked about our role models and what qualities we admire in our role models. And part of that is just the human process of learning and growing. We have to have something that we admire and that we see it, some kind of goal to go for. And so Jesus, hopefully, will be our greatest role model, but he's so much more than that. He's more than a role model. He is the very son of God, and he invites us into an intimate relationship. Now, some of us said our dads were our role models, and we were in close relationships with our dads but other people might have role models like george washington and yeah you can admire him and like his qualities but you don't really get into an intimate relationship with him the way we do with jesus christ so the relationship that we are called to with jesus is a relationship of discipleship and we're going to unpack that just a little bit tonight so jesus invites us to let him be our intimate teacher. So a disciple is someone who's learning to follow Jesus, to be like Jesus by being in an intimate relationship with him. How is this possible? This is a man who lived 2000 years ago? Well, because he is still alive in his body, the church today. So discipleship, is the process of becoming like Christ by following him. And that disciple then becomes a teacher to others in the Christian community. So a disciple is one who's learning, but who is also called to bring that relationship to others. To, and they have a part in that. Where do we find these ideas of discipleship well the bible of course so the bible says i give you a new commandment jesus said love one another as i have loved you so you also should love one another this is how all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another 
So loving and caring for one another is one of the hallmarks of discipleship. And in addition to that, our catechism, the teachings of our church say, the disciple of Christ must not only keep the faith and live on it personally in their own lives, but also profess it confidently and bear witness to it and spread it. Service of and witness to the faith are necessary for salvation. And that is a quote right from the Catechism. So how do we know that we're called to be disciples? Well, in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus approached his disciples and said, All power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. So here we have clear instructions from Jesus himself of what we are meant to do, what we are called to do. And one more quote that I wanted to share with you, this is from our US bishops and they say, being a disciple is a challenge. By the way, that's one of my favorite pictures, showing Abraham and Kristen who've just received ashes. And that is such a great model of how disciples are taught to be disciples. Abraham admires his friend who is a Catholic and he admires Kristen and all of us. He's learning from all of us. So he's not just reading a book to learn about Jesus. He's learning from being a member of the body of Christ. So the bishops say, fortunately, one does not become a disciple of Christ on his or her own initiative. The work of the Holy Spirit within the Christian community forms the person as a disciple of Christ. In other words, this is not happening in a vacuum. It happens in community. One seeking to learn how to be a disciple of Christ does so through apprenticeship. Apprenticeship links an experienced Christian believer or mentor with one who seeks a deeper relationship with Christ and the church. So in summary, we learn to follow Jesus from other Christians. So it's not just about the books you read and all the facts that you know. You have to be in relationship with other Christians. And we show we're disciples when we love and serve others and we have a responsibility to help others become disciples and apprenticeship in the Christian life of the parish is how that happens. Okay, so time to go back to our breakout rooms because um, that's a good, a lot of information to absorb. I just wanna draw your attention to these pictures that show people in our parish and in our community serving and being church in different ways. We have somebody reading, we have people gathered together at one of our community dinners. We have Fatima helping Uera learn how to sew. And then we have two children who are altar servers. So all of you have seen examples of this in the parish. So what, whether you have experienced it yourself or whether you've seen it in the areas of word, in other words, the scriptures, worship, our liturgy, service, or community, where have you seen examples of this kind of apprenticeship going on? Does everyone understand the question? You can nod. Everyone understand the question. Okay, so I'm going to give you just two minutes. Okay, just very quickly in the breakout rooms, I'm going to recreate the rooms. So you're going into different rooms. I'm going to open the rooms and you're going to get two minutes. And hold on, I've got to finish the time. So one minute per person. And here we go.
Hi, welcome back. <laughs> were you able to converse with the person you were with? We were, yes. Good. Okay, good. When everyone gets back, we'll do a little debriefing. Hi, Abraham. Hi. Uh, our Bible. Uh... All right, here we are. It looks like we're all back. Except Bob's picture looks very young there, doesn't it? Yes, he's, he's <laughs> younger since. <laughs> yeah. It's a miracle. Yeah, so there he comes. Hi, Bob. You're muted. You're muted, Bob. Um, so what examples did you see of apprenticeship going on in our parish? Well, um, Bob and I were talking about in our CIA, that, that, and he has someone who Kind of, who kind of mentors him in the LPI program. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I know that in our CIA, the influence of the sponsor, this person who is, um, who is already Catholic and who can get, share the wisdom. Mine was Maureen Campfire, who is such a lovely person who does so much for everyone in the community and volunteers and he has a lovely home, just everything anybody would want. And then I have tried to pass that along to the people whom I'm sponsoring. All right, great. Sponsors are a perfect example of that apprenticeship relationship. What other examples did you notice from our, from our parish or anywhere in our community of apprenticeship in the ways of being a disciple? Don't say Claudia. Just by, by the way, I had dinner sat or lunch Saturday with Dino and Cindy. No way! Were they yeah. in town? Yeah. Of oh. course, you know, I sponsored Dino. Oh, that's great. Uh, I'm glad to hear that. We'll have to check and see how they're doing later, but that's good. So the relationship that you had with two people who went through the RCIA, that continues even after they've accomplished that goal of being confirmed. Yeah. And that is a good sign that it's a relationship. What else? What other signs of, of apprenticeship and discipleship are you noticing in the parish? Well, I like talking to Ashley. I was just talking to her. And she's working. She was working at Daystar, which oh. made me, um, I, I, I like that she talked about that. Because I'm kind of at a turning point where I feel like it's about my choices. That's what I was telling her. I'm on my condo board and with COVID and all trying to get people to comply with the rules. I spent so much time on that that I'm not going to be on the board next year. I'm going to find something where I can be around people like Daystar. Very nice. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. You, become, you become aware of how <laughs> Jesus is calling you to be more involved, maybe to Better try choice. to an area. Yeah. yeah. Very nice. Better. It's not that I, I said to her, it's not like I'm robbing banks. I'm not yeah. doing really things but i'm waiting right i um so. when you when you said that i thought of kevin because kevin this last year has really stepped up and he's like really mm -hmm. throwing himself into the work of learning to be a catechist so he'll be ready mm -hmm. to uh, accompany other people who want to learn about jesus right kevin mm -hmm. oh gosh yes yes so <laughs> you're somebody <laughs> i see that in and i see it in judy who is well, really shepherding a flock of, of uh, secular Franciscans and stepped into that leadership role to guide them when, when uh, their whole world kind of got turned upside down because they can no longer meet uh, as they used to in person. And she's really thrown herself into helping them stay connected in prayer. Right, Judy? Yeah. Yes. Anybody else have an example? I just have a question. Sure. Um, what is a catechist? Oh, good question. A catechist is someone who teaches religion. And by that, uh, when we talk about catechists, it may sound like it's a school teacher who conveys a lot of facts. But in being a catechist, we are really making disciples of other people. So we are teaching religion by being in relationship with other people who are learning about Jesus. A lot of times a catechist is a teacher of children in the Catholic Church. But I'm a catechist for the RCIA program. You know, Kristen's a catechist in adult education. So anybody who teaches the faith. Yeah. And I just wanted just to say that um, the diocese has a training program to be a, to be a catechist. Yeah. 
you can learn, sharpen your catechist skills. All right, shall we go back to the, the it's slide? It's intense, question? it's intense, folks. It's intense, okay. Are, were there any other questions about the, just the basics of discipleship? We're gonna break it down a lot more. Any other questions about that? Oh, I wanted to tell you the story of how I felt called to discipleship. So I know you, you guys want to hear that story, don't you? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I was raised, I was born like any other baby. Babies are not born Christian. They're not born Catholic, they're just born. And then their family has them baptized. So I was raised in a Catholic family. I was Catholic my whole life. Had a, a time of turning away from the church probably in my late teens to my 30s, you know, so 10 or 12 years. And then I moved to Florida and I started to get more involved in the church and I was very determined to, um, to raise my kids Catholic. You know, they were seven and five at that, at that time. So they were at the age where I had to make a decision, are my children gonna be Catholic or not? They were already baptized, okay? So um, I, I was reading a lot, I was praying a lot, I was talking to the deacon, you know, I was going to mass regularly. And I had this, just this unsettled feeling in me, like, you know, now I identify it as God was calling me. But at the time, I didn't know what it was. It's almost like the first time you fall in love and you go, what the heck is happening to me? I'm having feelings I never had before, right? You remember that time? So for me, I was having that stirring, that feeling in me. And I thought, well, I keep hearing this word ministry. I'm not really sure what this word means. Maybe God wants me to do something in ministry. And, you know, I, that's, that's how much I didn't know. I didn't even know what the word meant. So I went to a Christian bookstore and I started looking through all the books. This was also before the internet. And there were no books on ministry, but there was a book on discipleship. So I bought it and I took it home. And as I read it, it described discipleship. It described exactly what I was feeling, that stirring in my heart of being called into relationship with Jesus. And I was like, I, I was just absolutely blown away. And in an instant, my life went from, I don't know what's happening to me, you know, to I want to be a follower of Jesus. It was that quick. It was that sudden. So to me, that's what the call of discipleship felt like. So I just, everybody's call is a little bit different, but that's what mine felt like. Let me go back to my screen share. When you feel this call, you're gonna have certain things that you wanna do about it. So how do you become disciples? Well, Christians enter into a discipleship relationship. And if I could ask you guys to mute yourself again, that would be great. Um, with Christ and the church through the sacraments of initiation. So when children are baptized, confirmed and receive Holy Communion, they enter into that discipleship relationship. And this is a lifelong relationship. It's always growing, it's always maturing and changing. So even though you're baptized as an infant, perhaps, you're gonna have to grow like I did. I was baptized as a baby. I didn't come to that moment of really discipleship, personal discipleship and accepting that relationship until I was in my 30s. But you can also become a disciple by a personal decision. And that's kind of what that experience was for me, that I made the personal decision to follow Jesus. Now mine was after baptism, but that can even happen before baptism. A good example of that is Abraham. He's here saying, I wanna be a Christian. I follow Jesus, I believe in Jesus. He's not baptized, but he's already received that call and has made a personal decision. So oftentimes these people feel that desire to give themselves to Christ and baptism comes later and that's perfectly okay. Now there are practices, things that disciples do so that they can grow in their discipleship. And I'm not gonna give you all the answers right away. I'm gonna put you back in the breakout rooms and your task is to just make a short list of the things that you think might be important to grow in discipleship, okay? 
So I'll give you two minutes because it doesn't have to be a long conversation. And uh, I will put you in new rooms. Abraham, are you still with us? Yes. Okay, great. I just want to make sure before I put everybody in rooms. It looks like you're all here. Recreate the rooms. Uh, and I'll give you another two minutes, okay? Go ahead and join your breakout room. Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome back. So let's just let's just list them. What kinds of things do disciples need to do to grow in discipleship? I'm going to write them down. Shout them out. Go to mass. Okay, go to mass. What else? Learn to cook. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. No. Um, uh, pray f as much as you possibly can. Okay, pray always. As the Bible says. What else? And cook. <laughs> and cook. I think um, learning to be led, I was saying to Ashley, I sort of think, I took, I, I use a day timer, but I usually just use it for my work. And I, I need to make a day timer for my faith and really set goals and kind of yeah. apply those principles. Okay, mm -hmm. so using a calendar, so you stick to a regular routine and it can have some yeah. discipline in your life about your Christian walk. Exactly. As I'm opposed to struggling with that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, you know, I, I kind of answer whatever call comes to my door. Yeah. And that's not always the right thing to do. Okay. Anyway. Thank you. Chris, well, Bob and I were talking about that, that uh, a time commitment discipline making it a priority because yeah um, like if you don't do it something else is going to come waltzing in oh yeah yeah because bob was saying that he sets aside his hour in the morning um for for his meditation okay so that coming back that to it, bob? well we uh Kristen and i both use the uh, liturgy of the hours and oh by the way that's so flexible she uses it differently than I do, uh, but it's both, <laughs> you know, loving the Lord and right. a, commit, a commitment of communication and fellowship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and for an hour or whatever time you put to it. And it's a good time for listening to the Lord, because it's not all about, oh, God, this is what I need now. And, oh, God, listen to my complaint. It's listening to his love words to you in the Liturgy of the Hours. So once again, we're back to that prayer and allowing time, consenting for God to enter into relationship with you and carving I out. One, I think one other thing that I'm going to try to do more is put God at the beginning of the list. I tend to like pray right before I go to bed, you know? Uh huh. And, uh, I think putting God at the beginning of my list in my daytime or not the end. You guys are very wise. Is there anything else that came up? If not, I'll go to my list. Okay, okay great. Let's go back here. I was actually kind of surprised when I started researching this to see what are the practices and go ahead and mute yourselves if you can. What are the practices of a disciple and how do you grow in being a disciple of Jesus? So the first one is pretty much what you said, that putting Jesus at the center, making him the priority. So disciples actually invite the Holy Spirit, Jesus, God, to be at the center of their lives so that every decision they make will be made in consultation with this indwelling spirit. So you're not blindly going through life just giving in to your passions, your lustful passions for chocolate chip cookies, which is my, one of my passions, um, without thinking about what consequences this has for your relationship with God. You put him at the center, not your earthly needs. And then another one that you all mentioned is that prayer. Being in prayer is being in communication with God. So disciples grow in their relationship with God by their prayer life. And prayer is absolutely essential to discipleship. And it is a routine that you have to discipline yourself to be in. Uh, and I know it's very difficult. 
Nobody said the life of being a disciple of Jesus was going to be easy. He's not a secondary person. He's the primary person in your life. Now, I think we talked about this before, too, but one of the practices of being a disciple and growing as a disciple is finding some way to serve others. So the Bible tells us that in the early church, Christians served others, and people knew Christians because they showed their love. They had a special place with the poor, the widows, and the orphans. So if this is something you have never done, it's something to just think about. How can I show my love for God by serving those who are the poorest or who are the most needy? How can I do that? And what do I risk when I do that? Of course, we encounter Jesus in the Bible. So disciples take the time to study the Bible, to pray with the scriptures, to memorize verses, and to embrace the life-giving words that they find there. And as Bob and Kristen know, praying the liturgy of the hours is actually praying a big chunk of scripture every day, several psalms, readings, prayers, and, and so forth, so that you can start your day or mark the hours of the day with prayer and with scripture. Disciples also strive to live a life of holiness according to the teachings of the church. And by that, I mean uh, the moral life. And that goes beyond keeping just the Ten Commandments. Jesus, of course, asks us to live the Beatitudes as well. If you are not familiar with the Beatitudes, you can find them in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 3 to 12. They go beyond the negative of thou shalt not do this and thou shalt not do that and give us more guidance of how to live a life of holiness. Don't worry, you don't have to master all this stuff at once. This is how we grow in discipleship. And God is very patient with us. What did I hear Bishop Barron said? That the life of the soul is very slow. So our growth in holiness is something that doesn't necessarily take place instantaneously. It grows slowly. God made us the way we are, so I have to think, that it's okay that we grow slowly in holiness. Another thing you'll find about disciples is that they practice forgiveness. Now Jesus, his death on the cross, as he was hanging on the cross, he prayed, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. And how good are we at that? That is really hard to do. Some people just, you know, it's so hard to forgive them because of how they've betrayed us or hurt us or been mean to us or disappointed us, let us down in our expectations. But whatever the reason, Jesus himself forgave every single one of us. And so we have to strive to do the same. So disciples really value forgiveness. There's a concept in most Christian churches called stewardship. And stewardship means that because God has gifted us, he's gifted us with talent, he's gifted us with um, time to share, so, and some of us he has gifted us with money, with riches to share. So because he has given us those things, we are responsible for sharing them with others. It's not that we have no right to have them. That's fine if we have these talents and riches. But because we are disciples of Jesus, we have to be responsible in how we use them according to the principles of stewardship. So stewards donate their time, their talent, and treasure to help build up the church and to do things like care for the earth as well. So every good thing that we are given, we are responsible for using wisely. And this, again, is a lifelong learning process. And it may conflict with some of the values you've learned as you've grown up. I mean, for many, many years, I used bottled water and just threw out the, the plastic container. Now, 20 years later, I made the commitment that I'm not going to use plastic water bottles anymore. So I have a pitcher in my refrigerator, and I drink water out of a glass. 
So that's just one small example of how somebody can change in their practice of stewardship. So our scriptures tell us, always be ready to give an explanation to anyone who asks you for a reason for your hope, but do it with gentleness and reverence. So, you know, many people on this Zoom meeting, many of us are so filled with the excitement and the love of Jesus Christ. We just can't wait for somebody to ask us about him. We're ready to talk to anybody who would like to know about Jesus. It's our joy to do that. But we don't go around pounding people over the head or judging them if they don't accept Jesus into their life. Why? Well, that's how God treats us. He's gentle with us. He's patient with us. And he asks us to do the same to others. So yes, witness to others. Be ready to tell them stories like the story I told you about how I gave my life to Jesus in a moment when I felt he was calling me to discipleship. But I tell you in an in appropriate context. I don't go around publics and stop people in the middle of the aisle and say, I gotta tell you this story. That wouldn't be an appropriate context. Look for those openings when you, in, when you are in relationship with other people and they're open to you ex, um, expressing your love for God to them and witness to them at those moments. Have a story or have a whole selection of stories that you can share with people. That's what I do. I think back in those intense moments and I'm ready to share those stories when anyone asks. And along with witness goes the concept of evangelization. Go and tell the good news, making disciples. So it's not just enough for us to grow in our faith, for our personal faith to blossom. There has to be a, um, a component of going out, telling others, and pulling them along towards discipleship. For the church to stay alive, everyone must participate in sharing the good news about Jesus and making disciples. So we raise our children in the faith. In fact, last night, I, um, I had a baptism preparation class for four couples who are bringing their little babies to us. And I had one slide to show them that was really kind of shocking. And the slide said that by the time children are 13 years old, they have made up their mind generally about whether they want to belong to a church or not. 13 is very young. You know, most of us who have multiple children, we're just kind of getting around to regrouping when our kids are about eight years old. And so to have the faith expressed in your home and to talk about your faith and to talk and share your relationship with Jesus with your children is so important because that window of opportunity is so small with children. That's why I love our catechists because they are willing to work with children. I don't know what's going on in the home of these kids, but at least I know the catechists are sharing their faith with the children. So not just children, but we tell our friends about the faith. We invite them to church. We model the faith as best we can. And if we find that people say, well, you know, you weren't very Christian just then. We have the humility to say, you're right, I'm sorry. I didn't model being a disciple very well. Okay, there's also a cost to discipleship, but I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. So can, we can reflect a little bit more on that last set of slides. Was there anything there that surprised you or that you'd like more information about, or even you would like to witness about how that has worked out for you in your walk of discipleship. It was very boring, wasn't it? <laughs> Are we in rooms or for what? No, I just wanted to get some quick feedback. Oh. Yeah. Uh, what's, what surprised me in my discipleship was that I had been I've taught Bible study. I've taught adults for many years. And I, I had taught people in RCIA, adult RCIA. And then I started doing some teaching for the children in RCIA. And I saw, I loved the materials we were using. I loved the way we broke it down to its essentials for them. And what happened was that I started 
adapting the stuff that I was using for the children for adults, thinking that if, if the adult is a beginner, not to talk to the person like he just started Harvard Divinity School or something like that, that to, to, get, to you know, get the basic concepts and get them um, in, a, in, in, in an intriguing or interesting way that relates to the person very directly. And, and so that, that nothing could have surprised me more right. than because I had never taught children, raised children, but teaching them is a different thing. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I'll... Go ahead. Okay. Um, I, I, grew, I grew up in um, an environment that um, mm -hmm. uh, I was managing large sums of money for IBM, uh, lots of people, and um, um, an organizational wizard, if you will. Uh, and I thought that um, after my retirement and, and anyway, and getting in, back involved with the Catholic Church, uh, which is a whole long story that's not done to be to told now. But I thought that uh, I, I ought to be doing something like, uh, you know, organizationally. And uh, I spoke with uh, Father Damien. He told me he wanted me to join RCAA and uh, I've been under Claudia's wing now for, for what five or six years or something yeah, like that. Five years, yeah. And, yeah. I've, and I've found that I really God has called me to be an evangelist. And I don't. I, I said at the outset I don't want to do this. Uh, yeah. This is not what I. This is not what I spent all of my life doing. <clears throat> um, so, uh, but uh, that's what it's turned out to to be. And uh, uh, Claudia has been a, an enormous help in uh, realizing uh, she she refuses to do anything to help me with Alpha, so <laughs> which is the evangelism <laughs> program. So she's Alpha. pushed me into uh, I got to do all that on my own and figure it out. And I am. <laughs> I so did thanks. help. I did help you with the technology part. Uh, well, you and I should talk about. Uh, uh, I, we've got some insights into Zoom, by the way, good, uh, direct great. insights to uh, California. Very good. Very good. Thank you, Bob. Anybody else want to say anything about that last set of slides? It's okay. Karen, you're muted. I see your mouth moving. Okay, I forgot to unmute. Yes, I was just going to add to what you say because I agree. I, I really always enjoyed children's ministry because they're so enthusiastic and I'm a conflict <laughs> avoider. Um, for me, I meet a lot of skepticism to anything these days and that's the harder part for me. Um, I just have a hard time when people are skeptical being a witness because I just don't like to argue <laughs> or, you know, that's just the harder part for me is the skept when you meet skepticism. So you can pray for me that I'd be better at it because I'm not. And, and I don't think we're meant to get into conflict arguments. We need to right. be able to explain our faith to others. So you have to have enough of a right. grasp that you can, if somebody comes to you, you can say, oh yeah, I right. can explain that to you. Or I have a pretty good idea of that. Let me look it up so I can give you the, the right answer, you know? But, yeah, for me, I my mind goes blank and I just don't say anything. And I'm trying to learn not to be that way. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm hoping that at least with breaking down discipleship into its components and into the elements that mm -hmm. help us grow in discipleship, um, right. the most important thing is not that you know all the slides, it's that how am right. I experiencing the call to discipleship that Jesus is offering to me? What, what mm -hmm. have I experienced and what have I never experienced? So if you, um, if you don't have a regular prayer life, then, you know, I'm telling you, this is one of the practices that are going to need to be fundamental to your call to discipleship for you to grow in relationship. Okay? I, I found that I needed to learn to listen to God. Yes. Mm -hmm. Shut up and listen. Cool. 
Thank you. That's right on, Bob. Okay. We all like to talk. Oh. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> okay, Darlene, do you have, oh, you got the sound back. I'm sorry. Uh, was it, was everybody losing the sound or was it just Darlene? It was just Darlene. Darlene. I okay. guess it was just me. <laughs> okay, great. And, you know, things come in and out. Okay, let's go back. We're getting, getting there. So there is also a cost to discipleship. Now, when I was young, I did what I wanted to do. You know, if, there, if I was in college and there was a party, I could go to the party. No consequences. You know, I, I just didn't. If I decided to sleep in on Sunday morning, no consequence. I didn't go to Mass. But when you become a disciple, there is a cost and there is a consequence to neglecting your relationship with Jesus. So let's look at some of those factors. Okay, so Jesus tells us that there's going to be a cost. First of all, he tells us that we're going to have to leave our attachments behind. So we know this from calling his disciples and they dropped what they were doing. They dropped their nets and they followed him. They didn't have a big discussion saying, I got to finish three years of college before I decide to be a Christian because uh, I want to have all the experience of drinking and carousing so that then I can be a Christian. That, that's not how it works, okay? And in Luke, he also tells us we have to leave our mother and father behind. And I think both of these scriptures can be read by, by explaining that what you're asked to do is put Jesus first in your life. And that doesn't mean you neglect everybody else in your life. It just means you have to put him first. And if there is something that's binding you, an attachment, whether it's good or bad to something in your life, you have to really examine that and decide, I'm being called to discipleship with Jesus. What would he want me to do in this example? Um, we really don't think that Luke meant that you have to totally neglect your mother and your father and follow Jesus. We think that it means it has to do with where is your heart? Is your heart first with Jesus? Or is it with, oh, my, my father expects me to be a lawyer just like him. So therefore I can't be a Christian. All right, that's one way to look at it. Another call of discipleship is to renounce our possessions. So this does not mean that we all have to just get rid of everything we own, although that's what St. Francis did. He took that quite literally, and he renounced all his possessions and his title and his inheritance to follow Jesus in the most uh, faithful to the gospel way that he knew. But I think what this means, again, is to understand that your possessions are gifts from God, everything we have. Every good thing that comes to us is a gift from God. Even if you worked really hard from it, you're able to work hard for it because God gave you the gift of talent, perseverance, your intelligence. So everything you have ultimately is a gift from God. And you have to understand that and put those possessions in their proper place. And as I said before in the discussion about stewardship, to also give back to those who need it when you have more than they do. Another cost of discipleship is this concept of taking up your cross. Unless you take up your cross and follow me, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Oh, hold on, I'm getting a call. Okay, and um, so it's, I think it's kind of a misconception many times to think when you become a Christian, when you become a disciple, I'll tell you, it feels really good. It does feel kind of like you're in love, you know? Sometimes it's so, wow, so you're at such a high, and you don't believe that anything bad is going to happen to you. But bad things happen. That's just the state of our lives as human beings and the consequences of original sin. So whatever has come into your life that is a cross to bear, a difficult situation, a difficult person, uh, then you're asked to take that up and to follow Jesus and to love him and love the situations in your life that you are tasked with. An example of this is um, in my own family. My son is mentally handicapped, and he always has been, and he always will be. He's 38 years old now, and he's very much like a, a first or second grader in his mental cognitive abilities. 
So in other words, he's absolutely delightful because that's the best age ever. So um, I'm grateful for him. You know, I love him, but he's never going to grow into an adult man in the sense of his, uh, of his abilities. In a sense, he is my cross, but taking up my cross has given me great joy. I just can't tell you. It's taught me patience. It's taught me unconditional love. It's like really like living with a saint because he has no, nothing bad in him. Um, there are a lot of other examples we could talk about, even this coronavirus being inflicted with disease, cancer. Many of those things are seen as crosses. But in every case, we're asked to take up our cross and continue to follow Jesus. He will not necessarily make the cross go away, but he will be with us every step of the way. And then finally, uh, a cost of discipleship is that you will be engaged in spiritual warfare. And so Ephesians tells us to put on the armor of Christ. And what do I mean by that? Well, in some cases, you will be rejected and you will be persecuted because of your faith. And I know that Abraham has firsthand experience of this. But in small ways, people can ridicule you, make fun of you, or, you know, tell you, boy, are you stupid because you still believe that Catholic stuff. And it's everywhere in this society. And so we are called to spiritual warfare to pray for those who persecute us and to love our enemies. And so those are some of the costs of discipleship. You may say that's not so bad, but when you face one of those situations, it does feel like a great challenge, but we always have our savior to lean on. So I think we're gonna go into our breakout rooms and I'm gonna ask you just for a couple of minutes to maybe think of a time when your faith cost you. And maybe it did, maybe it didn't. So the person you're in with, maybe they'll have an example. Do you understand the question? Hey, let me bring the recording back on. Hi, everybody. Hey. Hi. Does anybody Hi. have an example of where following cost you something or made you have to give up something to follow Jesus? You want me to give one? Sure. Okay. Go ahead, Kristen. Uh, this is a very, a very practical one, and that is that when I was going over my accounts with my financial advisor at Raymond James, she was looking at my budget on what I spend for what every month, and she saw that I make contributions to two churches that in terms of my income are fairly generous contributions. I make two countries there and there they are. And I always have them at the top of the list. You know, that's those top obligations. And so she's going over the whole thing and she's figuring, well, sliding numbers around and she says, well, you may not be able to continue with those, you know, that, that, that percentage of what you're taking in, you know, you just may not be able to continue doing that. You might, you might need that money for something else. And I, I didn't argue with her because that's, she's giving me the advice. It's my choice whether to take it or not. But I knew that they were not coming off the list. Yeah. That if it doesn't come out even at the end of the month, I'll, try, I'll find something else I can cut back on, but that, that's a commitment that stays. Good one. And here's, uh, as you're talking, I wanted to show you, I've had this on my desk for years, and it says, bring the tithes into the treasure. Put me to the proof, says the Lord of hosts, and see if I do not open windows in the sky and pour a blessing on you as long as there is a need from the prophet Malachi. So at the, at the time where I made the decision to actually conscientiously tithe a portion of my income back to the church and make that a priority, I was worried. I was like, you know, I, I won't be able to go to the movies, you know. So here's an example of where Kristen had to, and I had to put Christ before some of these other things that were wants, not needs. And I have never wanted. I've never wanted. And in this time of pandemic, I know the churches, our church, St. Mary's, is really 
really having a hard time financially. So um, I got a cut in salary. I decided I'm going to double my donation to St. Mary's. I'm not wanting for anything. So I, okay, I uh, believe in that. Uh, uh, if, if I want to pay by one line every month, so how can I add my account? Uh, if you want to pay to St. Mary's? Yeah. Yeah. I, my, my charge is St. Mary's. So. Yeah, yeah. So um, you can, you are registered at St. Mary's. So you can set up an account through their website where they automatically deduct an amount from your, from your checking account every month. But if you have no income and you don't want to do that, you can also um, ask them for envelopes. But because we're not going to mass, I mean, I don't know if you're going to mass or not. No, so. I want to set up the, uh, the online, you know. Okay. I how don't think about my income, so how it's about, fine. How about if Monday I help you do that? Is that I'm okay? Happy. Yeah, it's okay. Okay, I'll write that down. Today is Monday. Next Monday. I'm going to meet with him next Monday. <laughs> <laughs> Had me confused, Bob. <clears throat> Monday is almost over. Next Monday, <laughs> Abraham and I will meet in the evening online, and I'll look at his you know, bank stuff and, and help him get all set, settled with, the, uh, with uh, the contributions. All right. Okay. Thank you, Ron. Yeah, you got. What other examples of um, the cost of discipleship? Did you come up with anything else? Well, I sort of did have a, as far as standing up for the what you believe in. When I was a physical therapist, and in they refer patients to me, and the nurses had failed to send me the notes on a patient. This is a rehab center where they don't pay unless you do it. Uh, they didn't send me the request. So I hadn't treated the patient and the director of nurses asked me for fake notes. She wanted two weeks for me to make notes like I'd seen the patient, but I hadn't. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she said to me, well, who's it going to hurt? The nurses are going to get in trouble and everybody. And I, I just told her I can't do fake notes and I lost my job. So, wow. Yeah. But I just couldn't do it. You no. know, no, that's wonderful. That's that's really an example. And if you go way back to the history of, uh, and I don't mind saying it, Manhattan Convalescent Center, uh -huh. they investigated him about six months later, and she went to jail. Wow. Fraud. Been caught. Yeah. Fraud. Yep. Anyway. Good for you, wow. standing up for what was right. I tried. <laughs> you did. Anybody yeah. else? Cost of discipleship? Okay, let me see if I have any more slides to share. I've forgotten. Okay. Okay, so as well as the cost of discipleship, there's a reward for following Jesus. So everyone who has given up houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for, or jobs, for the sake of my name, will receive a hundred times more and will inherit eternal life. So why we are doing this is not just so we'll have a, a fulfilling life, although it is an amazing fulfilling life to be a disciple of Jesus in, on this earth, but we're also doing it so in eternity we can live with Jesus. We can be one with Jesus in eternity. All right, so what is this eternal life? Does that mean we're going to never die? No, that's crazy talk. So John 3.16, a very famous Bible verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So we don't know what eternal life looks like, but we believe that eternal life means being in communion with God, perfectly in communion with God. And that is our hope. And that leads us into what our next RCIA topic is, which will be on July 20th, when Deacon Mike talks to us about the, the end times, the second coming of Jesus. Those who die in God's grace and friendship are perfectly purified, live forever with Christ. They are like God forever, for they see him as he is, face to face. I'm looking forward to that. Okay, so with your partner in the room, 
I would like you to do one final assignment. And this is to decide as a partner, as partners, okay, something you can do over the next nine days to grow in discipleship. So we, we're picking nine days because in the Catholic Church, we have a prayer form that's called a novena. And that's where you pray the same prayer for nine days in a row. So you've learned all of those practices of discipleship. Maybe you'd like to make a commitment to pray a particular prayer for nine days or to do an act of service for nine days or I don't know what, read the scriptures for nine days. But you're going to pick something, write it down, everybody write it down, be very specific and be ready to be accountable to one another. So exchange your phone numbers or your email addresses. And there at the bottom, you can see there are some suggestions. So those are the, the practices of disciples, prayer, service, stewardship, evangelization, witness, forgiveness, surrender, and faith sharing. Okay, there's some examples. So let me stop sharing my screen, actually. Yes, we just have our closing prayer left. We're doing good, we're doing good on time. And Hi, welcome back. <clears throat> Does everybody have a strategy? We have a question. Okay. We didn't, we didn't have time to exchange phone numbers or emails. Do you have a list you can share? Or no. How do we do that? No. Can you just do that right now? I'll stop the recording. Thank you. All right. Okay. So we'll be talking. Okay. Before I think Kristen and I know how to contact each other. Yeah, we can. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, is there anything else we need to talk about before we do our closing prayer? I just had another question, which is, are you going to make the slides available? Because there's so much in them. Yeah. Yeah, if you want, I can send mm -hmm. you the link. It's a, it's a Google slide thing. So I just send you the link and you can look at them. Just don't, don't delete the slides. I won't. <laughs> <laughs> I just would like to read them again. Sure. Thank you. Okay. And I, and I will have that recorded. Everybody, does that apply to all of us? Can I look at the slide? I'll send it to everybody. Okay. Okay. How would I? mistakenly delete them. I'm afraid to open Well, you'll get an email that says Claudia is sharing these slides with you. And, okay. And you'll click on it. Okay. Okay. And and it and it will open up and you'll be able to go through the slides. Um, okay. If, if you have a Google account or a Gmail account, do you have a Gmail oh, yeah, account? Yeah, I do. Yeah. You have my email. Yeah. Okay. So if you have a Gmail account, you can add that to your Google Drive. Okay. okay. But if you if we're sharing the same document and you delete it, it will delete it for both of us. So I would say okay. you know, if you put it in your drive, rename like rename it or something. Yeah. So okay. Make a copy and rename it. Okay. Maybe save a copy for yourself and rename I think it. Maybe I should do that. Yeah. yeah really. <laughs> that would be a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> like that, your only copy of something else, telling people not to do. I know. I, that's too much power for me. <laughs> That's like, I'm afraid. Yeah. I should have thought. Of I, that. I go through life finding all the wrong ways to do things. I'm a real, I feel good at that. So, don't we all? Uh, I, yeah. I, I do. I do know what you could do, which is to download it to your system, which converts it to a PPT file, How and then you can attach the PPT file. But I'm not sure that they can open uh, the yeah. presentation. I yeah, I don't know. I, I'm not going to. I'm just going to share it because what I'm finding, I do so many of these um, big presentations. And if I store them on my hard drive, I, I don't have that much room left on my hard drive. So I'm trying to keep everything in the cloud on the big servers as much as, as, much as I can. So that's, that's why. And then rename it to a different folder. Yes. <laughs> and drive. Yes, sir. We'll do. We'll do. <laughs> okay. Are there any more? questions or comments about tonight's presentation. I, I hope that everybody learns something and that, you know, this will be somehow an enriching experience for your own walk of discipleship. And to that end, I have a closing slide with a prayer that I think is really, whoops, wait a minute. Here it is. Yeah, hold on a second. You've got it. I've got to go back here. Hold on. So 
All right, so I'm gonna share the screen again. I'm sorry, I was just a little bit flummoxed there. And with our closing prayer, this is tech technically known as the sinner's prayer. And when I had that moment where I knew I had to give myself to Jesus, this is essentially what I had to say. These weren't the exact words, but it's exactly the, the feeling that I had in my heart, that I had to kneel and say these prayers. And so I will, I will uh, pray this for you, because when we pray together um, and you're not muted, it's just a lot of noise. So I will pray this prayer for you and hope that in your heart that you can say this prayer to Jesus as well. So in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and invite you to come into my heart and live. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Yeah.